Hello, hello, good evening everyone. Welcome to another episode of I Care For Your Brain here on Facebook Live. Our goal is to give you evidence-based information about brain health and coping with brain health challenges that you can trust. We celebrated a big milestone this week when we reached 9,000 followers. That is such an exciting thing for us to see and it marks over about two weeks over our four year anniversary of being here. So the goal is to provide free access to high quality science-based information that is not based on hype or someone looking to sell you a product or a supplement. We are here to just be a voice of the scientific community. So our topic tonight is cortisol and the brain. And this is a really important thing to talk about because we have to demystify the stereotype that cortisol has. The way that we all hear about it now is typically that you don't want it to be too high. And that is definitely true. But what really happens when you are chronically stressed is you kind of lose control of your cortisol system. And what happens is it becomes very unregulated. And when it should be low, it's high. And when it should be high, it's low. So what we wanna talk about tonight is how exactly do we help it to stabilize and what are the consequences of having too much cortisol coursing through our veins or too little. The reason that this was on my mind this week is because we have another lecture of brain health uh, in brain school coming up tomorrow. So August 13th at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we are gonna go live with a two hour lecture on the psychology of aging. And a huge focus in that lecture is dealing with stress because guess what? Life is stressful, especially the way we live it now. So we have to really talk about the physiological basis of stress and specifically what do we do about it. And so a big part of what we talk about in that lecture is cortisol. So I wanted to just give you all a sneak peek of that lecture tomorrow. If you haven't signed up yet, the link will be in the comments. So cortisol levels and chronic stress really are a public health epidemic that we're all living through right now. Chronic stress at the most basic chemical level is related to cortisol. But the problem is, is that the way the cortisol system is set up in and of itself is actually very efficient and very elegant and is very time limited. It's excellent at managing the body and our psychology when something completely stresses us out or poses a threat or asks more than we are able to give. The problem becomes when we never come back down from the stressor. So that is a really important thing for us all to think about. Are we just intermittently stressed or do we find that it actually is kind of an everyday thing? Unfortunately, I think more of us would answer that it is more of a daily occurrence than it is a rare one. So let's learn all about this interesting chemical. Cortisol is a steroid hormone, technically in the glucocorticoid family. Most cells in the body have a cortisol receptor, which means that they can be attached to by the hormone. And cortisol isn't just about helping us manage stress. It really does all sorts of amazing things from managing metabolism to the immune system, to regulating the amount of water we have in our body, to helping to reduce blood sugar levels, helping to raise blood sugar levels, helping to reduce inflammation, helping us make highly emotional memories, things that we should never forget because there was such an important lesson there, helps us to control the sleep-wake cycle and our stress response. There are medical conditions that when your cortisol is too, too high or too, too low, you can have a diagnosis of either Cushing's disease or Addison's disease. In Cushing's disease, typically it's that there is a mass on one or two of the adrenal glands or there's a tumor in the brain's pituitary gland and it triggers the brain and the adrenals to make too much cortisol. You can also have issues where the cortisol goes too low where your body just doesn't make enough, and this is called Addison's disease. So like I said, what we're gonna talk about tonight is how cortisol and the stress response react together. And we're gonna talk about what happens when it goes too high or too low, how it becomes poorly regulated over time, and what happens if we go too high, overactivated or underactivated. So cortisol is interestingly produced by cholesterol in the blood, and it is released by those little tiny adrenal glands that sit on top of our kidneys. The secretion of the hormone is controlled by things in the brain called the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, the master gland, and those adrenal glands. And those three glands together combine to be something we call the HPA axis. And that is something that can become very hypersensitive over time. And we think 
In essence, that's what post-traumatic stress disorder and chronic stress really are, is that that system becomes highly sensitized. So unless somebody works a night shift, if you're just a person who has a, you know, things you do during the day and you generally sleep at night, your cortisol production is gonna follow that circadian rhythm. So in most of us, it is the lowest around midnight and the highest around 10 a.m. So that should already give you some insight into what cortisol does for us. So if it's at its lowest at midnight, we're actually supposed to be in a calm kind of a state. It turns out when it gets too low, we can actually get kind of overly calm into that state of fatigue. So that's one of those things when cortisol goes low, we worry that maybe people are having pretty low energy. Now it's its highest at 10 a.m. At 10 a.m. the sun is shining. This is when you're supposed to be kind of doing your brain's most difficult lifting. So that makes sense, right? It makes you alert. It makes you able to engage in activities at a high level. So like I said, tonight we're gonna talk about that relationship between cortisol and the stress response. So cortisol's function with how we handle stress is to basically prepare the body for flight, uh, fight, or freeze, right? And that response happens when we are faced with either a real or perceived threat. And what cortisol does at the very first level is it floods the bloodstream with sugar, with glucose. So immediately we can have an energy source that we have quick access to, especially for the large muscles of the body, the thighs, the arms, the middle. So that way, if something is coming at us, we can literally run. If something's coming at us, we can literally punch and fight and, and make our way to survival. But like I said before, the stress response is self-limited. The whole idea of how nature created it is once the threat passes, that all the hormone levels and all the things that it activated go back to baseline. Adrenaline drops, the cortisol drops, the blood sugar goes back into the body and we're able to return to baseline. The heart rate stops beating, your blood sugar, uh, pardon me, your blood pressure goes down to baseline levels and we basically reach homeostasis again. So you can kind of think of cortisol as your nature's alarm system. Some people like to call it nature's built-in coffee pot, that when you wake up in the morning, your adrenals make a fresh batch of the coffee and when you fall asleep at night, it shuts off. But what happens if this alarm is always going off or the coffee maker turns on and off at times that you don't want? So as we get more into this conversation, why don't we all take a minute to rate our stress level over the last week? Okay, so today's Wednesday. So what kind of a week have you had? Have you been at a one to two? Are you at a nine to 10? Are you someone that kind of sticks around a five? Um, it really is interesting to think how many of us have numbers above five. And so that's something that researchers have looked at. The American Psychological Association does a United States stress survey once a year, and they find that at least 70 to 75% of Americans are above a five, and about 50 to 55% of Americans are above a seven. Now that is pretty bad. So what happens when the stress response system never gets a chance to shut off? Well, then you're gonna have overproduction of cortisol in the beginning. But over time, if you're someone who's been through many stressors, been through many trials, traumas, and tribulations, what can happen is that HPA access over time becomes so sensitive that we kind of lose control of the cortisol response system. So when cortisol is high, this is when we can have symptoms of anxiety, headaches, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, digestive issues, muscle tension and pain, sleep problems, weight gain, and memory and concentration impairment. So why it's so important to me to talk to my brain health community about these things is you may already have baseline symptoms that are giving you those problems, right? You may have had a stroke or a TBI or you have depression or PTSD. You're gonna have muscle tension. You might have depression. What you don't need is anything else on top of your brain health challenge that is gonna exacerbate those symptoms. So if you're someone who has been through a lot of stress in your life, I really want you to listen to this lecture and try to figure out if this is something that's related to you. Cortisol problems over time weaken the immune system. They can set us up for uh, issues with bone formation leading to osteoporosis. So we really have to kind of define, I think, what actually is a stressor. And this is the definition that I have found to be most helpful. That a stressor is an internal or external event that requires more than the resources you have or are willing to give. 
Let that sink in. I thought that was so eloquent. It's something that basically pushes you, makes you feel like you're going to be depleted. You don't, you know, you don't have a, enough money to pay that tax bill. You don't have enough patience to deal with that person. You don't have enough energy because you have insomnia to go to that party, right? It's anything that challenges what we feel like we're capable of doing or what we want to do. So the way we react to life stressors is very unique to each person. And there's really two main things that dictate how we each respond. The first one are genetics. Believe it or not, we actually inherit a certain amount of our emotional reactivity. Meaning that if we came from a family of highly strong people, we're probably gonna have a hard time through genetics and learning and modeling in our environment how to cope with stress in a productive way. You also can have parents and grandparents that are cool as a cucumber and it's, you know, hey, you know, stuff happens and we're gonna get through it. And you can kind of, again, that can be in your genes, your DNA, or just, you know, in your, your home, the way you grew up. But what's really, really influential on our stress response is our life history our previous exposure to trauma. And this goes along with that true saying that trauma is cumulative for so many of us. That when we have a very strong stress response, it's kind of like a negative feedback cycle where it makes us even more sensitive to the next stressor and kind of reinforces some of those negative beliefs that we have about why the stressor happened. You know, uh, I'm doomed, you know, only bad things happen to me, you know, people stink. You know, I'm walking around with a kick me sign on my back. Every time a bad thing happens to a person who has those beliefs, it just gets reinforced more and more. So one thing we know about life history of stress is that the younger you are, the more it seems to get hardwired into your nervous system. So childhood abuse and neglect are two things that we know now have very devastating, far reaching impact for an adult's whole life. They've actually done a lot of research looking at aging Holocaust survivors. And of course, many of them have post-traumatic stress disorder and they were able to take levels of their cortisol. And what they found is that they had a three-fold lower reduction of cortisol. So this means their systems were so deregulated, so low, that it actually took quite a bit to get them to have that fight or flight stress response. The greatest reductions they saw were in those that were the youngest when they were exposed to the Holocaust, suggesting again that there's this developmental window where we can get hardwired with being reactive to stress. Speaking of the genetics, they actually looked at children of Holocaust survivors and what they found was that even a decade after these children were born, if their mother had PTSD, they still had significantly lower levels of cortisol in their blood. So that just shows you that genetic kind of life force uh, connection. So cortisol can be tested in the blood, in urine, in hair, and in saliva. The best way they think to do it in science is through saliva and to actually do it at four times during the day. Because again, cortisol goes with the circadian rhythm. So it is related to the sleep-wake cycle. It's related to our exposure to sunlight and to darkness. And so it's not the same over the course of the day. So we have to sample it at different points to make sure that it is on a regular schedule. One thing that I thought was interesting when I was doing my research for you on this lecture is that the reason they don't often test cortisol with uh, getting a blood sample is because there are stress inducing effects of getting blood taken, that your cortisol actually goes up the minute you see that phlebotomist coming over to you uh, with the needle to get the blood. We actually have a spike in cortisol, so you would get an artificial increase at that time. The group of people that have worked with cortisol the most and have given us the most insights from a research perspective are military veterans and our VA medical system. They have really taught us that it's not a matter of the cortisol just going high and staying high. They've really done so much research with veterans in the field, soldiers in the field, veterans once they come home, to realize that folks with PTSD have a very variable cortisol system, okay? So what happens is it seems that their cortisol is super high in the morning, which I know will be a big insight to those of you who have PTSD or love someone with PTSD because sleeping and morning time is so difficult. Higher levels of cortisol after a trauma, but then once the trauma goes away, 
the cortisol levels actually bottom out and go very, very low. So what this suggests is that those of you who are chronically stressed might not have your typical normal rise and fall of cortisol throughout the day. You're gonna have more peaks and valleys. And maybe some of your symptoms now are related to this. So what they think now they know is that when cortisol is low, it is connected with avoidance, withdrawal, and isolation, which makes sense with what we know from Addison's disease and Cushing's disease. We know that there are specific symptoms that go along with high and low cortisol. When cortisol is high, this is related to the hypervigilance, the hyperarousal that we see in PTSD, or the intrusive memories. We also think that cortisol being unregulated has a lot to do with the experience of chronic pain and fatigue syndromes, including fibromyalgia. So I thought this was so helpful because it's like another inroad that you and your doctor can explore together to figure out if this is possibly a contributing factor. So in terms of recommendations, which is how we always end our lectures, the key is really to keep your cortisol in natural rhythm, stable, reactive when needed, but flexible so it can go back to normal when there's not a threat. So just to review again, when it's low, we see symptoms of fatigue, dizziness, especially with standing, muscle weakness, mood change, darkening under the eyes, and weight loss. When it's high, one of the telltale signs of high cort um, cortisol is when we have weight gain around the midsection or the upper back, a rounding of the face, irritability, headaches, intestinal issues, anxiety and mood swings. So again, we just have to really talk about how is it that we can stabilize this sometimes destructive hormone. Well, the first thing, the most important thing is stress management. How is it that we can experience stress differently? Because if stress is gonna come, it's our responsibility to figure out how we can best handle it. We are not passive victims of stress. There are strategies, and this is what we focus on tomorrow in Brain School, there are strategies that you can use, but of course I'm gonna share some of them with you tonight. Most important thing, stress management. Second most important thing, what you put in your mouth. There's uh, foods that have been associated with the ability to regulate cortisol. Dark chocolate, I'm happy to tell you. Bananas, pears, black and green tea, and yogurt. Any probiotic, those are the one, two, three, four, five, six, top six foods to eat to better manage cortisol. Next one is to avoid foods that are heavily processed with sugar, white bread, candy, soda, even fruit juice is not good, too, too much sugar. Staying hydrated, I thought this was super interesting that even when we are mildly dehydrated, the brain interprets that as a threat. Water is the essence of life, including our own biology. And if we don't even have close to enough, the body starts to have more cortisol being pumped through the veins released by the adrenals because it's a threat to homeostasis. There was a study in 2018 looking at soccer players and even mild, mild levels of dehydration increased their cortisol when they did the test through the saliva. Making sure that you are respecting the need for continuous sleep every night. Sleep, daytime, uh, exposure to sunlight and cortisol are var all very intricately related. Um, and so if we're not getting at least seven to eight hours a night, cortisol levels cannot be normal, okay? And this is strongly related to that idea of extra fat in the midsection is there's a very strong relationship between sleeping under five continuous hours puts you at a two and a half higher risk of being overweight, especially in your belly. Not good, associated with poorly regulated cortisol. High intensity exercise. So you can use exercise in kind of two ways. If you wanna push the cortisol and you wanna feel more activated, then 15 to 20 minutes of intense exercise produces cortisol. But if you wanna do something like moderate to lower exercise, like yoga, Pilates, walking, these things are scientifically proven to reduce cortisol. So that's why when you're stressed out about something, you know, after you've had maybe even something like a panic attack and you can just feel those stress hormones in your body, they probably last about 24 to 36 hours after a huge stressor to get out of your body. You can do yourself the favor of yoga, walking, okay? One of the things we focused on in science in the last two years, to my delight, is the importance of nature and walking outside. So there was a study in 2019 in the Frontiers of Public Health that showed that taking a 20 minute long walk at a minimum significantly lowered cortisol levels. In Japan, there's a beautiful phenomenon that they're promoting a lot now with you know business people and um, you know 
people that tend to be stressed out, early parents, called forest bathing. And this is a phenomenon where they believe that there are essential oils in the pine forest specifically that have a very calming effect. That it's not just a matter of being outside, that really going into a forest where there is old growth is able to uh, specifically and hormonally help your nervous system deregulate. I, dis come down from being hyper-regulated. Um, the last one we're gonna talk about is mindfulness. This was something in the early uh, 2010s that became um, very much the focus of health psychology. And what we now know is that when we direct our energy at the here and now, especially to sensory experiences, you know, what do you see? What do you smell? What do you feel? That we are really able to lower resting cholesterol. <laughs> oh my God, cholesterol. Ah, cortisol, you can tell I've had a long day, that's funny. Um, and so, you know, that's that some people say depression is you're stuck in the past, anxiety is you're stuck in the future. And so mindfulness is so powerful because it can consume us in the here and now, we're not able to let anxiety or threats in the future um, kind of get into our head. So why is this all so important? So I said before, if you have a brain health challenge, I don't want anything else adding to it. This is really the gateway to internal peace of body, peace of mind, less stress, less anxiety, um, things like high blood pressure, which are so important to brain health, you know, better focus, better feeling like you're in charge of your life. It is so important to try to implement some of these things in the habits of your daily life. If you think that this is something you really need to learn more about, I would love to have you at Brain School tomorrow. Um, there'll be a link in the comments down below. And for 17 bucks, what you get is a link to the two hour live lecture with a Q and A at the end. The replay is sent to you 24 hours later so you can watch it anytime for the rest of your life. Um, you will get a PDF to a 68 page workbook that accompanies the lecture, which has long articles in it by me, all my PowerPoint slides so you don't have to worry about writing down anything, uh, trivia, small group discussions, all anything we can think of, cutouts you can put on your refrigerator, anything that would help this information stick. So please join us. We have been having an absolute blast for the last five months. We have four more Brain School lectures after this one to complete the series, um, and they will not be available afterwards. So if you don't join us uh, this time around, not sure when or if we will do it again. So we would love to have you there. If you thought that this lecture was important or helpful, it would really be our honor if you would share it. That's really how we make our way around the internet is word of mouth and people letting other folks know about us. Uh, if you could also do me the favor of going to YouTube and following our channel there, I would be most grateful. Thank you guys so much. It's such a joy to be with you here on Wednesdays. Next Wednesday is an audience request about a new treatment for stroke recovery. So that is what our topic will be next Wednesday. Hope to see some of you guys at Brain School tomorrow. Have a good night. Bye-bye.